What's up, everybody? Alex here. Welcome back uh, to a very special show. So I have another interview that's coming with uh, a composer, arranger, orchestrator, all things Lewis Robert King. So most of you probably don't know uh, that name, but I would guarantee you that the vast majority of you have heard his work before. So an arranger, composer, uh, orchestrator, he has done a ton of work over the years um, sort of creating the soundtrack of our lives in a lot of different ways. He has worked um, with countless companies, whether it's Geico or Microsoft. Um, he, he has done work for Disney films. He is responsible for uh, the uh, opening sort of uh, jingle that you hear on the Columbia Pictures intro. Uh, he's, he's just done so much great stuff that I have the utmost admiration and respect for. What does that have to do with my channel other than him just being cool? Um, well, he was the orchestrator and arranger on this great record that I'll spend a little bit of time talking about. So this is a record that was released on Coal Mine Records last year called Changing Light by the Ironsides. And this was one of my favorite records last year. Incredible San Francisco psychedelic soulful instrumental music, but with these lush string arrangements, these brass sections that was a throwback to kind of late 60s, early 70s European soundtracks. I mean, the listening experience of this is just unreal and this blew my mind. I posted about it on Instagram however many months ago and just said, man, I love this record and showed it. And uh, Lewis actually, he got back to me and said, hey, thanks so much. We got to chatting and he's like, yeah, you know, I did all of that, you know, all the orchestrating and all that kind of stuff. Cause this, I mean, what we talk about in the interview but this record has an entire orchestra on it, um, upwards around 25, mid-20s into the 30s in terms of actual orchestrated tracks on it. Um, and, and this record just blew my mind. So I wanted to talk to, to Lou. It was an amazing conversation. I just love picking his brain, especially outside of things that normally I talk about, right? You know, I love talking to musicians or people as in people in bands, but you know, for him coming from like the orchestrator lens, um, the arranging lens, the composing lens, it was absolutely fascinating. So um, here's the interview here. I will say it, I am going to do a giveaway. Somebody will receive uh, one of these records. So I believe in this record so strongly. It blew my mind so much. I want to share it with anybody who would care to listen to it with me. So um, all you have to do is leave a comment. If you leave a comment, you'll be entered into the drawing. I will leave this drawing open for, oh, I don't know, maybe a month or so. So I'll, I'll probably cut it off around May 1st. Um, and uh, yeah, you have until May 1st, leave a comment and you are in the running for this record again. Even if you aren't necessarily a psychedelic soul listener, I, this is just such a beautiful record. I think you, you'll love it either way. It's just, if you're just a fan of music, you will love this record. So there you go. Without further ado, please, again, thank you so much. Leave a comment if you want one of those videos. But here we are, my interview with Lewis Robert King. Cheers, y'all. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Really, really excited to be here. A very special uh, episode of the show. Uh, today, I'm really excited to introduce you to Lewis Robert King, composer, arranger, orchestrator, all-around amazing person, I feel like, um, to the show for a conversation about any number of things, uh, which is going to be awesome. So, um, Lou, I just, I really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. And, uh, did you come prepared today? Because you're on the beer and vinyl show, so I want to make sure that you came prepared. Yes, I mean I, I have quite a, a wheat sensitivity, so I stick to the to the to the grape. But sure. uh, you know, we we are imbibing. We knew where we were it. coming. We came prepared. I love it. You, I could not ask for more already. Now, what what are you sipping on there? I know you're a bit of a, a but I mean this respectfully. The amateur connoisseur, would you say? Not quite sommelier. Not quite, you know. Oh no, I'm I'm nowhere near a sommelier. I mean, I uh, let's put it this way. I I give wine as gifts often, and everybody is thrilled with everything I give them. I probably have I don't know 500 bottles in my apartment. So we do we we do we do go through the wine. Uh, I love it. But yes, uh, we're sipping on a, a wine from a, a winemaker. Who actually uh, a, a renegade California winemaker who died? He passed. I think it was last summer. Uh, his name's Sean Thackeray, and he he was uh, he was an incredibly passionate person about wine to the point of uh, incredible research. How did the Etruscans make wine? How did the Romans make wine? 
uh, he really delved deep into it. And the way he made it was not the way everyone in California would make things. He didn't have like, you know, temperature controlled cellars and things. It's like he made it in the backyard, yeah. uh, essentially. But uh, it's a it the this particular wine, it's just from some from a, a block that had vines planted there long before he bought the sp- the space, and it was it was a random, like a little Zinfandel, a little Pinot. It was a lot of the old Italians that yeah. it was whatever they planted there, and he's made blends out of out of whatever was there. It's a really wonderful wine, and and it, it and a, a great a great wine community guy. Uh, it's, a sh- it's a shame he's no longer with us. Well, and and, and cheers to him, and uh, that, that's that's awesome. And um, you know, obviously on, on on this show, the people who know me know that I always go for something really classy, especially when I do these interviews or conversations in the, in the beer world. And so today, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, this company before. It's a little bit of a local place. Um, it's called Pabst um blue blue ribbon Um, i have heard you have heard so you know that's um i'm working on my sponsorships with them but so far i haven't gotten there but maybe this will put me over the top and they'll you know they'll go from there so uh thanks for for indulging me in that so we have a a lot to talk about i think but would love to um kind of jump in uh for you just would love to hear more about your um, background, but maybe how this whole thing began. I mean, did you grow up in a musical home? You know, what kind of, what was your first exposure to music? How did you fall initially into this wide world of uh, music and, and all that has been able to offer all of us? Um, it, it's, it's a bit of a surprising path because I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't the at the age of five, he was a piano prodigy kind of story at all. Um, I didn't come from a musical family. No one in my household played an instrument. Um, there was music around, but no more than any household. Um, but I, I remember being, I don't know, like eighth grade, ninth grade, something like that. And the question was posed, hey, do you want to play in a school band? I think I was approached. I remember. I don't remember what they were trying to get me on. And my grandmother said, I love the saxophone. I think it would be great if you played the saxophone. So I gave the saxophone a shot. So I started playing saxophone. Uh, and I very much enjoyed that was uh, music became a very enjoyable thing. Uh, soon, soon as that progressed, I mean, I did well. I was pretty good for, for a kid. Uh, and I started to branch out. I kind of became a little bit of a utility player for my band director. It's like if we needed, if he needed a trombone player for marching band, I ditched the saxophone and would pick up trombone. Right. I started playing bass because there really wasn't a lot of opportunity to play a saxophone in a wedding band or anything <laughs> like that. Or if you were trying to be in a cover band, that really wasn't going to work. Yeah. And, and, and bass kind of fit well. I, it, I had a, I had a melodic head. So playing single lines made a lot more sense than playing chords. And I still can't wrap my, I can't do a guitar chord to save my life. So that was a more logical thing. So during my teenage years, you know, I played in wedding bands and stuff like that. And uh, when I was started to look at colleges and trying to figure out what I would do after school, I actually thought I would probably pursue teaching and be a band director, music educator. I really thought that would be where I would end up going. And a uh, my band director had me talk to a, a a a friend of his who had gone to Berkeley College of Music. He sat down. And he's like, "What do you want to do?" And I'm like, "I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that." And he said, "No, you should apply to Berkeley." He's like, "You should check it out. It's great. You can do all kinds of cool." And blah, 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 kind of sold me on it. And like, this was something that hadn't even entered my mind. Right. And uh, and I should I should give a shout out to both people. My band director Mike Ryan, who's who I don't have a career. If, I don't have him. He was, he was a great educator. He, uh, he, he went above and beyond. He did a class for me and a few other people where we were doing music theory at mm-hmm. like eight o'clock in the morning before classes started. Yeah. He didn't have to come in and he didn't have to do that, but he was passionate about teaching and he loved doing it. And again, like this was the blueprint for me to be able to have a career. So I had that. And then the person that he introduced me to was a guy named Andy Gravish who is a phenomenal trumpet player who has had a, a, an amazing career. 
when he came out of Berkeley, he toured with uh, a lot of big bands. Uh, he was mm-hmm. in uh, uh, he was in Artie Shaw's band. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was in uh, oh, why am I blanking on this? Buddy Rich. He played lead trumpet for Buddy Rich's band. I mean, not, not a slouch. No. Not a slouch of a trumpet player. No. Uh, so, and then I applied to Berkeley, and surprise, I actually got into Berkeley. So yeah. m- I thought, well, uh, uh, Berkeley had a, a a program where you could do kind of a dual major thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, great. I'll go there. I'll get a music ed degree. And I'll get a performance degree as a saxophonist. Then I get there. And I meet actual tenor saxophone players, and I, I figure out very quickly that I am not going to be them. That it's, ain't going to happen. It's, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> well, th- these people had a, a, just a natural ability yeah. beyond what I had been gifted with. Yeah. I may have musical ability, but the idea of what you could do with, a, with an instrument, I did not possess that. Yeah. So at the same time that I'm coming to this realization, and adding, you know, years, uh, taking years off the life of my tenor saxophone teacher. Uh, I have other instructors who are being incredibly encouraging about my arranging, my composition chops. And it's becoming clear that, well, if, if I'm not going to be a music teacher somewhere, this would probably be the place where at least my talent uh, could, could actually support a career. Yeah. And then I started to change my uh, focus more to that. And I mean, literally with the tenor, I, I, you know, there was a certain amount of, you know, proficiency that you have to show on an instrument. As soon as I was done with those, packed it up and packed it up in the case, went in the closet, still have it for sentimental reasons. I don't think I've played it in, you know, all this time since I've left college, like it does not get played. Um, so that, that got me, uh, that set the path in college. Uh, was about to graduate college, didn't know what to do, wasn't exactly sure uh, how even to start a career. I had a professor tell me, look, you're going to starve wherever you go. You should starve where there's work. He said, either move to New York or move to L.A. L.A., right, yeah. (laughs) I'd never been to L.A. I knew nothing of L.A. I was an East Coast guy. So New York seemed like the only real target. And is New York home for you? I mean, no, originally... not at all. No, okay. no. I the the I grew up in a uh, small town called Minersville, Pennsylvania, oh, on okay. the eastern side, kind of in the middle. Let's tie it into beer and vinyl. It is two miles away from Pottsville, which many of you will know is the home of Yingling, America's oldest, largest brewery, craft brewery, still to this day. Still to this day. Uh, yeah. So there you go. I'm well aware of Yingling. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I won't. I won't get into any teenage antics with Yingling, but uh, I'm sure they happen. Uh, so yeah, so it was where you're going to move, and I had friends who were moving to New York, so it was an easy. It was an easy decision to come here. Yeah. So it, it, fascinating. The I guess uh, you know the you mentioned sort of jokingly, like we we hear stories all the time of like, well, you know. I started playing piano when I was three years old and had a very disciplinary teacher. And then I tried yep. out for Juilliard yep. when I was eight, you know, and it's like all yep. these things, but it almost feels very happenstance, unintentional of, I kind of fell into this early and then had the conversation of, well, I guess I could do this, you know? Yeah. Music's cool. Why not? Right. Yeah. Uh, much of my career has been more, I don't want to say complete happenstance, but it, it's not, it's not, Nothing's been obvious. It's mm. it's not like you know your example when you when you when you're that six year old that is a prodigy. People are planning out your future, and opportunities doors are opening for you already. Mm. So you're not really thinking about that either. It's just these are the things that are in front of you, and you're going through them. Yeah, my career isn't that different. I, you know, I moved to New York, and I'm desperately trying to not get a day job because I had a little bit of money saved up and I, and I, and it was like, if I can just stick it out for a short amount of time, this was, this is how naive I was. If I could just stick it out for a short amount of time, something's going to happen. And yeah. then you can build on it. Something's going to happen and you'll build on that. And I got very lucky. Uh, uh, I ended up getting a, 
uh, interview for an internship at a music production company that did music for advertising. Mm -hmm. And basically the job was you would come in and you would, you know, clean the floors, do whatever grunt work and do that kind of, kind of thing. And I, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And, and I got hired and that was the door opening that I didn't intend to go to a, to, to what would be called a jingle house. That wasn't the goal. Uh, honestly, I thought, you know, I'd stumble into something writing a big band chart for somebody or something, you know, uh, that I didn't, I didn't necessarily think that's where it would be, but that opened the door. And it wasn't too long after I started that, uh, doors started opening there. So, you know, you're doing the work that you're being asked to do, which were, you know, pretty long days. It was generally about a 12 hour day of doing all the things that needed to be done, but you had access to, to their recording studios. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the other hitch with this was the, the education that I got, I was a, basically like a, a pencil and paper composer. Right. I really wasn't using technology. Um, I had, I had been in recording, I had been in recording studios many, many times at Berkeley, but I wasn't doing any of the engineering or anything. I was providing the music and conducting and, but yeah. someone else was recording. I never touched a console, never touched a tape deck, never any any uh, computer sequencing. I had done none of that. So and I roughly in, started r- roughly what year ish are we talking here? Early nineties. Okay, so yeah. you know, I'm walking in and I know nothing of any of these things. So I have to learn all these things okay. at the same time. So I'm learning how to use all these things: microphones, microphone placement, recording levels, everything. So you're doing that, but then at the same time, I've got, you know, I can come in at any time on a Sunday. I could be there for 16 hours and play with this stuff and learn things and experiment. And then at the same time, you're being encouraged to, well, you know, we got this add in, you know, why don't you write some music to it on the weekend? If, you know, if the schedule will out and if it's good, maybe we'll present it kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. The other opportunity, the other door that opened was, uh, the they had a staff of i'd say six or seven composers incredibly talented people phenomenal great guys and really talented however they didn't really know anything about an orchestra they didn't really know anything about a big band so you could write the bones of a piece of music but when it actually came to let's you know let's have an orchestra play it they would hire someone from the outside to come in as an arranger orchestrator and they would take the sketch and kind of turn it into what it would really be. It wasn't too long after my being there that there was an opportunity. They said, well, why don't we just have Lou do it? So I did one and that, that was, that was a fun, that was a fun experience. It was also the first time I ever conducted uh, a session with, you know, professionals uh, outside of college. Uh, I had orchestrated it. We were on the way to the, to the recording session, uh, the people I was with, it was the creative director and the composer, the creative director, the, the uh, composer was like, I don't really want to conduct. And, and the, uh, the creative director said, well, I can't, I have to, he was playing piano. He's like, I can't do it. So he turns to me and says, Lou, why don't you conduct? I conducted. And this did not have a click. And there were really specific hit points along the thing. So I'm being thrown into a bit of a baptism by fire, sure. but, but I had it, but it was great. Everybody, uh, everyone in the session, I think had some idea that they'd never seen me before. So they assumed I must be somewhat new, but, uh, they were very accommodating. I always try to keep a really light, fun atmosphere in a studio um uh, you know we're serious and we're doing things that are serious but i'm i'm not i i'm pleasant and i like to keep a jovial i'm cracking jokes i'd like things to be everyone to have a smile i want everyone to want to give the best performance that they possibly can as opposed to the environment which is a bit more like you know you didn't do that right that's not right that kind of thing that uh, doesn't work that's an interesting point i guess i didn't consider of the you know the the role of the i guess conductor in that space right of um not only the sort of the physical aspect of it but sort of the more 
um, okay, I also have a responsibility to to create whatever environment is going on that's going to be most successful for for those playing it. Um, you know, similar. I mean, that that could be almost like the educator kind of coming out too of like what's going to make the best space for the people in this in the space yeah. to yeah. feel better, to feel more comfortable, to be more relaxed. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's an additional part of that, right? Yeah, I think I think part of the if you're going to if you're going to be the leader of a recording session, if you're going to be the person who is out there um, dealing with the musicians, your job is to get the best performance out of them you possibly can, because there's a lot of different situations. It could be something where you're doing your own work and you want it. There's also the situation where, like for this one, it's like I'm really like a translator. I've got someone who either wrote it or there could be you know uh if it's in the commercial world people from an advertising agency or you know people from a brand marketing people could be there they're going to be saying things and i'm the person that needs to translate what those things are to the people who are performing the music yep and you're trying to get the best out of them you're trying the way you're going to do that is by having everybody having a good time we're playing good music and we're having a blast doing it this is going to be yeah. fun uh i think it's i think it's incredibly important and i think this isn't exclusive to this i mean this is you know top down uh environment is true of every business that exists you yeah. know it, uh, so yeah without yeah. question it's leadership right i mean i guess that's what we would call it, it being, being a yeah, leader that's true that's so true. You mentioned something that actually kind of made me think about this, maybe some education for, you know, people that are watching, because I feel a lot of times those that are not familiar with this world, we use a lot of these phrases interchangeably without actually talking about what they mean, you know, the arranger, the composer, yes. the orchestrator, <laughs> the, you know, it's like, you know, could you walk us through maybe a little bit of like what the differences are, you know, or maybe in the example that you were giving of like, no, someone gave us, you know, the piece of music it was my job to do these parts yeah. with it like oh, that'd be great if I you can. could talk the differences between those and and what sure. that looks like well i i the first thing i'll say is that if you if you took those three terms composer arranger and orchestrator and you made a three circle venn diagram at any point all three of them could completely be on top of each other or they could be completely not touching mm -hmm. uh it 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 really it, it really is gray and very situational, but in broad mm -hmm. strokes. So a composer in the strictest definition would be, what are the notes? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you went to a piano, think of Happy Birthday or the Star Spangled Banner, doesn't matter what it is, and it got played on piano, uh, it was played in its, you know, whatever the notes are, you know the melody and you know the things that come along with it, that is the composition. Now, let's say I come along and say, I'd like to do Mary Had a Little Lamb, but we're gonna do a swing inversion. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna change the melody. It isn't gonna be, you know, Mary had a little lamb. It's gonna be Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, a little lamb. So that is an arrangement. I'm now taking something and I'm 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 adding things to the musical uh uh, uh the bigger musical picture. Mm -hmm. Could be style. It could be uh, uh, counter melodies, harmonies are different. Uh, you're uh, creating things that weren't in the original. Uh, right. And then orchestration is literally who's playing what. There's yep. a bunch of notes. Well, what instrument is playing what note? And so that's really kind of the distinction between those three. Mm -hmm. And then the truth is, is you say, okay, well, uh, uh, Aaron Copeland was a composer. Yeah, he was a composer. He's also the arranger. He's also the orchestrator. He did everything. He created the entire piece. This is true for most people who are composers. More often than not, you're hearing, certainly I can speak for myself, when I hear a piece of music, I hear the whole thing. It's flushed mm -hmm. out. It, it's, it's what it's going to be at the end. Yeah. But that's not always the process depending on uh, the situation that we're talking about. Uh, another Another example where an arranger gets used a lot, and, and this is something that I do quite often, is someone will have a song. Songwriters, a band, they create the basic tracks, they have the melody, they have the, the, the lyrics, vocals, they have this thing. They're like, 
man, this thing would be great if it had strings on it. Yeah. But we don't know how to write for strings. Let's get yeah. someone who does. The phone rings, the email comes, and now you are now going to be writing something that fits inside a piece of music that already exists. It's yeah. often referred to as a sweeten. Okay. Uh, string sweeten, horn sweeten, something like that. Yeah. So you're taking something that exists and now you're ideally creating something that feels organic to the larger piece that it fits. You're not just like writing something. It's, it's got to make sense in context. Yeah. Uh, and you, uh, in that case, you're probably also the orchestrator because you're deciding, you know, is this violins, is a viola or their cellos, yeah, I it's, think it's, that, I think it's that kind not of simple. Yeah, it's funny. Even that, it's like it's not simply just saying, "Oh, we got to add strings to it." It's like, yes, but what kind, and from where, and who, and how many, and right. all that, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I, you know, I think I, you know, I appreciate that, and it, of course, you know, I'm like going down the rabbit hole, thinking, mentioning what you were just talking about of like, you know, say it's just a band, a rock band, because I know one of your big projects was sort of orchestrating some of these classic, you know, rock albums or songs or different things in a more orchestrated way, which is, I think, it's, you know, something that's been going on for a while, but, but I always think with something like that, how much it has changed over the years with technology, because, you know, from my understanding, you would probably be able to say a lot more is like, you know, from what I understand on some of these like keyboards now, I mean, you can have a patch that is a full string section built in programmed into a keyboard ready to go or into the computer ready to go and i'm wondering if that has changed the dynamic a little bit more because now it's just a matter of oh we can just press a button or kind of have an idea and that is going to give us what we want instead of having to go outside of our scope or what we're used to have you seen changes in that sort of way yeah well that that technological change has been going on for a couple of decades and it has a huge effect on how music is created, the choices that musicians have, the choices that productions have, everything from a piece of advertising to a documentary film to a, a major studio release, even the, the processes that, are, uh, that go on to create the music are, are completely different than they would have been, say, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, you know, the 90s is kind of when this stuff started to take shape. Uh, but it really what's happened in the last 10 years is kind of remarkable. Uh, what I can do, what I can do with sample libraries and what I can mock up and the music that can get created. I mean, I can fool musicians. There's a whole bunch of things it can't do. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a long list of what it can't do, but what it can do is pretty remarkable. Yeah, I, uh, I guess Berkeley connection. You know, I've said on my channel, my favorite band of all time um, is is Dream Theater, and you know, kind of mm -hmm. progressive metal band. They've been around forever, but they originally yeah. met at Berkeley, and uh, you know, they're they're the musicians' band, right? Like they're like for all the sure. you know. The, yeah. Um, the people out there, but you know, Jordan Rudis over the last however many years has made, he he's put his foot in so many different categories, not just musically, but the influence of technology. And it's so fascinating to me, you know, it's like you hear these records or you hear them live and you're like that. I mean, that's an orchestra, right? Like that's an orchestra. It's gotta be an orchestra or, you know, we're hearing voices now we're hearing sopranos. We're hearing all these things happening and it's, and it's a patch, right? It's a layer and it's, and it's just so, yeah. It could be, or it even could just be pre-recorded performance. Right, yeah. That wouldn't be, that. that's pretty common too. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it costs a lot of money to put a tour together. It costs a lot more money to haul a choir around with you. A lot yeah. cheaper to just play along to something pre-recorded. You give the drummer a click in their ear and, and off everybody goes. Oh, so, yeah. you know, but, and then the flip side to that is, is there are productions where things are being augmented by, by fake strings or whatever, Broadway certainly has that uh, when you see a Broadway show, there's a whole bunch of live musicians, but often they're being augmented for budgetary reasons. Yeah. Uh, when you hear music in an ad, 
it could be an orchestra. It could be out of a computer. It, 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 when you see a film, depending on the budget, depending on the particular mm -hmm. cue and depending on priorities, it could be all live. It could be a little bit of musicians performing live. I mean, it's really yeah. all over. And, you know, some of it is also kind of the sound. Uh, yeah. You know, some, some, some scores, some film scores sound like they do because it's not a live orchestra. And I don't even mean synthesizer centered scores. I mean, just scores that have, this, this is the sound. This is, we took, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a library that has violins doing something. We took that and I manipulated it a little bit. Yeah. And now that's the sound of what's going on. So, you know, creatively, it opens a bunch of doors. Yeah. and gives you opportunities to do things you never could. It makes the process of getting from, you know, I'll speak in the world of film, from saying, if you think of, you, you can still find, you can find a YouTube video of John Williams playing piano for, for Spielberg, showing mm -hmm. him what the music's going to be for a film. And yeah. that's off, That's what it looked like in 1975. That still yep. was like that. But yeah. then as time goes on, people were like, okay, well, technology is going to allow us to give you some idea of what this is going to be like. That's kind of when the, when the 90s come around. Yeah. The technology is good enough that it's like, okay, this is a bit what it's going to be, but it's not anything anyone should actually hear outside of this room. Right. Then by the time the very late 90s, the aughts and into the teens, it's like, that sounds pretty good. I don't think anybody's going to notice one way or the other kind of thing. So you get a lot of, you know, in commercials and lower budget things where this is how things are going to be made because, yeah. they, you know, they don't have the, the uh, ability to do it any other way. Well, you know, not to go down the music and, you know, art business world, although that would be a really fun conversation, but yeah. I can't help but think <laughs> too, specifically in the realm of music media and physical media. Artists don't make a whole lot of money selling CDs and records anymore. And so the, yeah. I would guess the choice to do something that is more quote unquote digital, because, you know, we might not be able to afford to bring in a 24 piece, you know, like to do these different yeah. things because it's just not there the same way it might've used to be. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a struggle for any artist. Yeah. Uh, there, you're always straddling the line between what's going to make, the best art and can i afford that yeah. and I, there is a large number of I, I, certainly almost everybody everybody obviously that i've worked with made the priority of this needs to be people playing a violin we can't fake this yeah. and i think a lot of that is also very genre dependent mm -hmm. i think when we're talking about soul music, you can't fake it. You just can't. Like what strings do on, on a soul cut or even a soul influenced cut, it's very, very hard to do convincingly. And so there's that part of it. But I also think just from an artistic point of view, a lot of these artists feel like, no, I, I want the real thing. The record's real. What I'm trying to put out there is real. This is part of that. We'll figure out how to where to cut and what, how to accommodate it. So maybe the album doesn't have, there's eight or nine cuts on the album. They're not all gonna have strings, but maybe we have two that are gonna have strings, right. something like that. So right. I think trade-offs happen. Yeah. I wanna go back to your sort of story about when you were doing the ad, that that first mm -hmm. sort of, you know, role, doing the ad stuff and sort of the, the process of that. Cause I think that sort of, segued into the question I asked about the difference between, you know, an arranger and a composer mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So in, in that type of situation, I would guess with maybe some of the ad jingle, you know, type of work or whatever, somebody else has composed it in that sense, sometimes most of the time, and then they give it to you for the potential arrangements, orchestration. Is that how that would typically work? Or is it one of those things it's right. different every time and you just learn to do whatever with it? No, for that very for that specific example, and what I was doing for 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 quite some time while I was employed there is yes, the staff composers were composing something, they were p figuring out what the notes was. They would do a very crude mock up of what the orchestra would do mm -hmm. uh, because of the technology at the time, 
uh, it was very bare bones, but it would get the point across. And the truth is, what really what really sells a piece of music is the melody, and what else is going on. I mean, that's that's the largest part of it. Um, that's the core of it. And then yes, then I would be filling it out, arranging it, and orchestrating it because I would be changing things. It would be oh, there should be a counter melody here, and there should be motion, and the you know the harmony can move a little bit, and you so what. What someone would have heard in that kind of mock-up to then what you heard when we were actually in the studio, it's different, but it's not completely different. It's just, I I would say, enhanced. Maybe we've gone from black and white to color. Uh, You know, it's like that kind of, it comes alive. And and we had the ability to make changes. I mean, that was not uncommon either, that we'd be at the recording session, someone would say, yeah we you know maybe not that maybe this is too busy can we make that simple very simple you know you know cellos violas we're just going to hold that first note through the bar kinds of things and you'd make it make change record great everybody's happy so at my my career at the at the uh at the jingle house for the most part my job was a composer's assistant and i was so i did you know engineering some mixing and I was doing orchestration and arranging when the opportunity arose. On my spare time, I was writing demos for, you know, composing for for ads uh, here and there while I was there. And then, uh, but that that was what I was doing there. And then when I left, I became a freelancer doing similar things. I was still doing a lot of advertising work and I would occasionally get hired to do Arranging or orchestrating for an ad, but for the most part, I was composing at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, taking that background, obviously, a lot of the ad work, you know, you've done, you know, obviously scoring, uh, whether that is, you know, TV shows or, you know, movie scenes or all these kind of different um, areas take the complete sort of uh, sidestep now into how I personally got acquainted uh, with you was, um, you know, through a a great little uh, record label that everybody knows that I'm obsessed with called coal mine records. That's located about 90 miles down the, uh, down the highway for me. And at some point I, I, you know, the brief story for you was that I was watching one of the uh, uh, videos on the coal mine Instagram and, and Terry was going through the the 12 releases that they put out in uh, 2023. So Ooh. I was just watching, okay, these are the 12. Oh, that sounds good. Oh, I might like that. Oh, that sounds good. And he shows this one. And, and I knew nothing about it, had never heard it, had never heard of it. I'm so new to this. I don't know much. And, and he mentions, like, this was the biggest project we've probably ever <laughs> done. And to me, I'm like, ooh, I'm in. Like, biggest project lots of resources count me in and uh you know of course you, you've probably seen this too of uh you know coal mines is so well known for their hype stickers you know the things that they will put on and it's a lush soundtrack of atmospheric instrumentals and yeah you know in seven words yeah so i'll talk a little bit more about you know ironsides coal mine i got some monophonic stuff here too but how you know, how were you introduced into this? How, how did this whole thing come about? Um, and again, because I, I just, this was my favorite release of last year. I have played oh, thank the you. hell out of this. And, uh, and what I think is so cool about, you know, being able to have this conversation is to me, like, it's, it's incredible music all the way around. But to me, it is the depth and it is the atmosphere and it is all these strings and it is all, I mean, everything about this has just blown my mind. Um, and it's just that, you know, that you're kind of behind so much of that is just this, the coolest to me. So how did this sort of come about? Um, and God, what was this process like? Well, first off, thank you very much for the kind words about, about the album and about coal mine. I, I, I we share sentiments about coal mine. I, I, I love the label. Uh, Terry's great. Uh, and I'm glad I'm glad that that video, uh, op- you know, piqued your interest and in, and and got the record in front of you. Yeah. Uh, so the this process, uh, well, the opportunity really started 
in 2017, I think. So I had a, a, a friend reach out uh, named Chris, Ed, Chris Edwards, who was friends with Kelly Finnegan. And Kelly and Chris were working on something, a project that they were being, being called The Sentiments. Mm -hmm. And it was two singles. They were going to release them on 45s. And they needed string arrangements. So I did the string arrangements on those. Great tunes, really Philly soul. If you don't know them, find, find, find the sentiments. You can still find the 45s and you can definitely stream it. Two great tunes. So that happens. Fast forward to 2020. And I get a call from Max Ramey who is the uh, bassist and leader of the Ironsides. Uh, Max, unbeknownst to me, played bass on the Sentiments tracks. Didn't met, never met Max, didn't even know, didn't, 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 didn't know him. Yeah. He calls and says, so we want to do this, we want to do this album. This is kind of what we're looking for. It would be instrumentals, it would be an orchestra, it's rhythm section. This is kind of the thing we're looking to do. Would you be interested in being, you know, being a co-writer and then taking care of everything that's orchestral? It was, what are we, October of 2020? So we're still pandemic slow professionally. I certainly yeah. have the opportunity. I have the time. Um, I, I, I kind of knew the circle that we were going to be working in because Max plays, uh, also plays bass for monophonics. I knew kind of the coal mine circle. Uh, I thought, you know, the more I learned, it's like, okay, this is going to be a coal mine release. Uh, I was, I was interested creatively. I assumed that everybody was going to be great to work with just knowing the whole vibe of the, the people who are going to be involved. And, you know, the fact that it was going to be on coal mine was the fact that we were going to, it was going to get done right. It was, we were going to, it was going to get released and someone was going to know it was going to get released because it's really hard to release music. You're, you know, you're throwing a pebble into an ocean and no one may even know it exists. Yeah. So the idea that this thing would, you know, get all the, it would get all the support that you would hope something you put out would get. Right. So that was the initial. And, and the other thing was, you know, I think for both me and Max, it was one of those things where, well, we'll start this. And if it isn't working, it doesn't work. Like, we'll give it a shot. Because um, for all we knew, I was going to be thinking Z and he was going to be thinking, you know, N. And we were going to be nowhere near each other of, of anything. Yeah. But it turned out not to work out that way. So the, the nuts and bolts process of this, uh, the guys had recorded some basics already. So mm -hmm. the the process was going to be I'm also in New York City. They are in in and around Petaluma, San Rafael, Bay Area of California. Yeah. They would send me the basics. So I would get uh drums, bass, and guitars. Mm -hmm. So we have chord changes, we have form, we have a vibe, we have a groove. Now we're going to have a conversation. Okay, what is it? What are we? What are we doing with this? Where does it go? How big is it? How small is it? How grand is it? Uh, what uh, emotionally? What are we trying to to evoke? Yep. Is there any imagery whatsoever? And that was kind of the first way of having a conversation. Then I would listen to the to the track over and over kind of get it in my head and then you know and this is kind of true of my creative process in general whether i'm scoring a film or anything else it's like i like to or even doing a string suite and i want to get familiar with it so that when i'm just walking down the street an hour later something's going to come into my head from my subconscious because it's in there yep so i did that and then i started to do what we alluded to earlier, create a mock-up. So technology made really made this possible where I could uh, build on top of the basic tracks 
This is what the strings are going to do. This is what the brass is going to do. This is what the vibes are going to do. This is what the harpsichord is going to do. Yeah. Uh, and do something that was very, uh, was a, a, a pretty true example of what it would look like when we recorded it live. Yeah. I would send that to those guys. They would listen. We would have another conversation. This is great. Maybe the melody could be a little simpler. Maybe we should hold this off until the second verse, that kind of thing. It was very, a lot of really big picture stuff. There wasn't a lot of, no one was overly prescriptive. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I was, and that went the other way too, because there were, there were songs that I heard before they got recorded when they were still in the demo stage, where it's kind of like, well, what do we think of this? And it was like, I think that's maybe a little bit like that. Maybe you could just, you should do something a little bit different. You know, mm. what, what I think, what I think the, the real strength of one of the big strengths of the album is because of this collaboration that I came from where I come from and they came from where they come from and we had input, but no one really stepped on anybody's toes. No one was telling anybody what to do. It was you bring your thing. And we weren't, we, we never really needed to adjust that much on either side. I mean, we, it really did click. I mean, this could have been a total disaster. Meaning, you know, you, yeah, you this, do something. This never, like, this never happens in, in music. Is, it, you know? Yeah, that's true. That's true. If you if you watch enough music documentaries, this is never yeah, how it there's goes. No, there's no behind the music, the Ironsides. Like, there's no. no this know. is it's going to be a very boring <laughs> one hour of your time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, they they we but we were on the same page. I mean, that was just it. I think that's really what it was because I've been writing music like this for for a long time. It's you, you just heard it on, maybe you heard it on an ad 15 years ago, or maybe yeah. you heard it in a short film. I mean, this is not, you know, that it's, it's yeah. I'm writing film, you know, from where I'm sitting, I'm writing film music. I've heard a lot of people use, you know, talk about library music. And it's like, yeah, I mean, library is just film music that hasn't found a film yet. But in my mind, I'm just creating film music. This is no different than anything I would write for a film score. Yeah. It's so fascinating, you know, kind of connecting the dots here because, you know, as you said, you're like, this is what I've been doing for a long time. And, you know, this is the type of music that I, this is what I do. Simultaneously, it's the same for them. You know, it's like, that's the type yeah. of music they're into and what they love doing. And what's so funny is like listening to Changing Light, you so distinctly hear both stories there. Like you hear that san francisco soul you hear yes you hear a lot of monophonic stuff for sure that influence there and then you hear your bits and it and it also completely completely just transfers you into you know soundtrack but it's just saying soundtrack feels lazy you know there there is a there's a picture there is an experience there is a you know it's getting sort of uh compared to you know, late sixties European, you know, soundtrack work and all these yep. different things. And it's yep. so interesting because you can certainly hear both of those distinctly and right in the middle where it just works out beautifully too. And so allowing both of those sides to, to breathe and have that distinct sound, but not be combative and not, it, it just, it just goes together so well. Well, well, thank you. That's wonderful to hear. And I'm, 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 I'm glad that it resonates that way for you, but yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was a great experiment that that just happened to click that that everything really worked. Yeah. So you go, you continue through. There's a good amount of back and forth about what you're thinking. Some of these mock-ups that you know we we're just talking. Who knows what that could have looked like twenty years ago in terms of the technology of being able to kind of be able to go back and forth, share files, all that different yeah. stuff. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. granted global pandemic and a lot of, you know, that's not anything to, you know, obviously make positive light of. And, um, you know, technology plays a huge part with that because now once you get these parts that people can agree on, they feel strongly about, now it's time to record them. Yeah. Now it's time yeah. to, and now it's yeah. time to move forward with it. So what was that process like? Yeah. Well, to, to talk a little bit of how it would have been done, what would have happened was, you know, it wouldn't have it could have been very similar meaning someone lays down the basics and then you 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 bring somebody in to do everything else you just wouldn't get to hear what it was going to be before you actually got to the session so yeah. it would kind of be that 
someone would maybe would play, you know, someone would be, if you're 3,000 miles away, they'd be on the phone playing you the melody along yeah. with the, you know, you know, they'd be playing the, the quarter inch reel to reel of the band. They'd be playing yeah. the piano on the piano melody. And they go, yeah, I think that's pretty good. And then yeah. you'd straighten anything out that you needed to at the session. Yeah. That's, that's it what it would be. High quality like. audio there too, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so once, yeah. So that process was how we did every song, getting it to where everybody was happy with it. And the truth is there wasn't a whole lot of back and forth mm -hmm. there. We, 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 like I said, we fit together really well and have the same sensibilities. And I often, I often knew what we wanted to do. I had ideas of where something should go just hearing it uh, because the, the, the foundation of these songs had a point of view. They all pretty much have a point of view. If you swipe away the orchestra, what's there comes from a place. Yeah. Uh, and even the things that are more, a bit more droney, uh, uh, like, uh, 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 silver and violet mm -hmm. they still have a point of view there's a vibe yeah. so it's creating something that kind of works within that vibe but anyway so getting to the to, to how we recorded it what i had hoped we would do is kind of take a week book a room come in for the, i'd fly out we'd record everything kind of over a week and that would kind of be the most efficient way to do it but that didn't really work out that way because we were coming out of the pandemic and everything was coming alive and you had musicians who hadn't worked that much. No one said no to anything. Yeah. So getting anybody together at the same time was very difficult. We, it was a lot of, well, we can get strings on Tuesday at 10 AM. That's, that's going to be it for the next 14 for days. That, yeah. yeah. So the, I mean, the record took a long time to record because of things like that. And then, you know, we were, we were, we recorded it. At, well, Kelly Finnegan was our recording engineer. We recorded it at his place, his recording studio. So, you know, we're moving around between monophonics albums being recorded and when can you find people? And so there was a lot of scheduling uh, constraints, but then the actual recording for the orchestra sections, we did them in pieces as opposed to having 20 or 40 people in a room yeah. uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, some were financial, some were, so we had more control. Yeah. Uh, so we would have four violins. What you're hearing on the album is really what 12 or 16 violins sounds like. We just mm -hmm. layered them. Yeah. We didn't really have the budget for 16 violins. So we did it this way. Uh, and. I would get piped in. So they would take a laptop, put me in front of the group, zoom me in, and I would, I hesitate to say conduct, but I would rehearse, lead, answer all the questions. Yes, play it that way. No, let's more vibrato. Let's make this a little grander. Uh, and I was really only hearing the players in the room, how it was actually fitting together and timing and, you know, the the locking into the track was kind of left to max and you know, to kind of get that thing but it was it it was surprisingly uh it worked surprisingly well it wasn't ideal but it, it really did work yeah how many uh different instruments are on the on are on this record i mean you, I mean, you know it's, I mean, well, let's see. On the biggest tunes, which would be something like, I think Outlines mm -hmm. probably has the largest group. So you're looking at, um, what does that have? That's got a nine piece brass section, trumpets, trombones, bass trombone, French horns. Uh, you've got a uh, flute and alto flute. The string section, I believe, is. That one is violins and cellos. There are no violas on that cut. But that, you know, that's 20 odd players just on that. And, and like I said, and really the violins are emulating a 12 or 16 piece group. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you did this in a hall, you need 40 people right. plus the band. Right. And, and that's the, the sound that it gives. Yes. Right? Yeah. You know. Yes. 
Yeah. And, you know, and let's be layering is not a new, you know, thing. No. It's like, as you talk about, you know, music recording now and, you know, the, the guitar solo has four different tracks, you know, so it's like, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're talking, I mean, for that track or for some of these cuts, you're talking up in the 20s in terms of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. Absolutely. And, and obviously, all, as we said before, all real here. Like you would do all real. You would do the mock ups kind of, you know, digitally or, you know, from your home or whatever it is and kind of say, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what this sound would, this would sound like. Um, and then obviously when it comes to recording, it's let's get them in the room and and, and let's do it. Yeah. You know, I, I create a score and parts and I'd email them out and they'd have them there for everybody. And then we'd per, yeah, they would perform. Yeah. There's, there's, I don't think there's anything on the album that isn't performed real. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. And and you mentioned it before too. I want to give a, a, a shout out. Um, it got, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of amazing, amazing musicians and people out there, but I just think, uh, and maybe somebody that uh, I think music, music people know, especially those involved with coal mine or know about coal mine, but man, Kelly Finnegan is a busy guy. And he just, I think he's like positioning himself as like <laughs> genius territory of like the stuff he does and what he's able to put together. But uh, but there's also some arranging and some orchestration you did on this record too, right? Um, yeah. The Shape of My Teardrops, I think specifically, which, yep. I mean, first of all, this record is out of control good. Uh, amazing. And and obviously that track in particular is just gorgeous and just, I mean, it has like the fingerprints all over it, right? It, uh, my favorite, I think that's the best album they've ever done. It, it's definitely my favorite and they've had a lot of great albums. So that's saying something, uh, yeah. and I am particularly fond of uh, that song. Even if even if I wasn't involved, even I if you would, weren't, it still course. would be one of my favorites. It's just a great song. It's just a yeah. great song. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so, so, oh, go ahead. Well, no. So the, you know, the process for that is pretty much very similar. It's like uh, for string sweetens or arrangements on top. I'm getting sent a a, a rough mix of what's already been recorded we'll have a conversation of what's the vibe, what do we kind of want things to, to do? And then I would do a, a, a mock-up of it. And that would be what we have our conversation of. And once we agree what it should be, I'm writing parts, sending it off. I'll usually, I'll pipe in uh, early in the session to just say, this is what you need to know. This is what I think you need to watch out for, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's a five minute conversation. I'm off and, and, and they record so yeah yeah um so you know approaching sort of the the, the hour here i want to be respectful of, of time what's interesting i had to keep sort of uh remind myself about iron sides and changing lines that this is this is the debut right i mean yeah it, yeah oddly enough and you know one of the things i don't know uh if you're um kind of like you know a classic soul you know fan or anything like that but it's so funny when i hear this album in particular, some of the modifying stuff, sure too. But when I heard this particularly, it took me back to uh, like Isaac Hayes, Hot Buttered Soul, like that that good progressive soul with this huge sailing orchestration that just put. I was like, oh, this is like this is the throwback. But you know, going back to this, you know, this was a debut, which feels weird in the sense of just that it was such a huge project, right? Um, yeah. You know, obviously, you're not gonna bury any leads here. We're not looking for any sound bites. We know there's millions of people out there looking for. What's next with the Ironsides? <laughs> but you know, the social media says there there are things cooking. Um, you know, there there are things happening. True is is it true? Is this narrative? Is this fake news? You know what's what you know what's 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 going on here? What's going on in Ironsides world and in your world? Uh, coming up, uh, I I can confirm that uh, more music is being created. I. <laughs> Don't have a timeline, but I can tell you things are being made. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can't say schedules have been nailed down, but we, we've definitely been working up more things. So Love it. we're excited. There, there will be more for people to hear. With, so, uh, yes, that's, amazing. That's about the best I got for you. Hey, on well, the, I was just on looking the iron for the confirmation, front, you know. Yeah. Yeah, on the Iron Sides front, that's the best I got for you. You know, we we waited like 30 years for Chinese democracy from Guns N' Roses. And if we can wait for that, I think we can well, wait for the Iron Sides. So just don't <laughs> make just 
<laughs> just promise me it's going to be better than Chinese democracy, Lou. That's I was going to say, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to go with that comparison. But you, sure, we can, we yeah. can just own it that we waited a long time for nothing. Okay, I'm just putting it out okay, there. Okay, well, so. we'll go it on the. Yes, that was a long time to wait for disappointment. There they have disappointed that's, that's, you sooner. There's the yeah. sound well, bite right there. Is that yeah, you know, yeah. com composer rags on Chinese democracy? Is that? <laughs> um well this was awesome i really appreciate it you know everybody as i said in the um as i said in the intro uh to the video you know i i just love doing this stuff These, this is not uh this is purely for selfish reasons i just really enjoyed this conversation and i have no idea how many people watch these videos or um or anything like that but to me just as a i don't know a thank you or to you or to the iron sides or to coal mine or to the people out there um i will be giving away uh one of these records i truly true believe that people out there if you're in to this world you need this record you absolutely need it now here's what's funny you'll like this lou so th there was a bit of like this record kind of went viral a little bit for a couple, obviously now yes the record itself is total has done three million streams on spotify the title track alone is over one million but the big thing, and this was the conversation I was having with Terry, was that somebody on Instagram got a hold of it, posted it, and it just blew up. Coal Mine, the store, is sold out of these two special copies. So there's just the black left. And you know, no one's just black vinyl anymore. You know, got to have the... <laughs> That's true. What is this? The Coke bottle clear? And, you know, the... Yes. You know, the blue swirl? You know, it's the good stuff. But... Uh, you know, all you all got to do is just, you know, leave a comment, uh, you know, whatever that is for you, if you're interested, but I cannot recommend this enough. It's no bullshit from me. This blew my mind and still continues to. And I would recommend this to just not just anybody who's into sort of soul music or anything like that, but I just think any fans of music and opening up your mind and just this blew me away and still does. And um, you all deserve it. So um, that that's sort of the, the giveaway for that. But uh Lou, this was awesome, man. I just can't thank you enough. And uh, yeah, just thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's very flattering to that you wanted to talk and this has been a lot of fun. And uh, I, I, I really enjoy the, the podcast. And uh, 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 again, I really appreciate this. And I appreciate the, all the kind words about the Ironside and all the support. I, I, I appreciate it. And uh, uh, it's amazing. Amazing. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks so much again. Hope you have a great weekend. For everybody out there, thanks so much for watching. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see what happens next with uh, with you and the Ironsides and all the things that are around the corner. And uh, yeah, just thanks so much for being here. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Take care.